Hello everyone, I am Pratibha Rao, an adult endocrinologist at the Cleveland Clinic and I'm here today to discuss with you the evidence-based management of type 2 diabetes with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD or heart failure. We'll do this in a case-based presentation and let's start off with case 1. The learning objectives. After completing these cases, the reader should be able to identify indications and contraindications for GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. In short, I'll be referring to them as GLP-1 RA. Summarize the literature on cardiovascular disease and CKD or chronic kidney disease reduction with GLP-1 receptor agonists. Review how to prescribe common GLP-1 RA agents recognize and manage adverse effects from GLP-1 RA medications. So let's start. A 65-year-old man presents for type 2 diabetes. Diabetes was diagnosed 8 years ago. His most recent A1C was 8.3% on metformin, 1,000 milligrams twice daily. He does not have any known microvascular complications from diabetes. Comorbidities include hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease with MI status post PCI times 2. His medications include lisinopril 20 mg daily, amlodipine 5 mg daily, atorvastatin 80 mg daily and dual antiplatelet therapy. He does not smoke and rarely drinks alcohol. He denies any chest pain, edema, orthopnea, or dyspnea on exertion. On vital signs, blood pressure 128 over 74 millimeters of mercury, heart rate is 78 beats per minute, and his weight is 178 pounds with a corresponding BMI of 32 kilograms per meter squared. Addition of which of the following agents is the best next step to manage this patient? 1. Saxagliptin, 2. Glimepiride, 3. Semaglutide subcutaneous, 4. Ertugliflozin. The right answer is 3. Semaglutide subcutaneous. So let's look into why we chose semaglutide which is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So I want to bring, you, bring your attention to the 2022 ADA guidelines, which recommends that while metformin has been the first choice for type 2 diabetes management, we may now use a GLP-1 receptor agonist and or an SGLT2 inhibitor in addition to or instead of metformin. The therapeutic regimen depends on comorbidities, patient-centered treatment factors, management needs, and evaluation of these comorbidities like atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD, and heart failure. So GLP-1 RA or SGLT2 inhibitors are the therapy of choice in patients with cardiovascular disease, whether it's ASCVD or heart failure, and CKD, and particularly those agents in the drug class which have demonstrated cardiovascular disease benefit in studies. So I want to walk you through the studies and once again reiterate why semaglutide is the drug of choice in this particular patient. And several GLP-1 receptor agonist studies have demonstrated cardiovascular benefit in large studies. Liraglutide, primary and secondary endpoints in leader, dulaglutide in rewind, and sustained six subcutaneous semaglutide have reduced the risk of MACE, that is major adverse cardiovascular events, in adults with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular safety was established for oral semaglutide in Pioneer 6, and the sole study is currently underway to investigate if the oral formulation of semaglutide is also shown to benefit with cardiovascular risk reduction. And I wanted to bring your attention to the ADA guidelines in 2018 for management of type 2 diabetes 
in adults. At that time, the treatment and the management options was totally glucose-centric with, apart from initiating lifestyle changes, it was setting the A1C target and initiating the pharmacotherapy based on A1C. If it was greater, less than 9%, go for monotherapy. Now, fast forward to 2021, look at the shift and the paradigm shift indeed in the change in the management options and the therapeutic options for type 2 diabetes. It's no longer said that you only set A1C as your goal. The first line therapy was stated to be metformin in 2021. Of course, along with the comprehensive lifestyle, including weight management and physical activity. And then you go and look for indicators of high risk or established ASCVD, CKD or heart failure. And dependent on that, you go down the route of management, whether it's ASCVD and indicators of high risk, then you choose either the GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT-2, depending on the patient-centered management factors. And if there was heart failure, the first line would be an SGLT2 inhibitor. And if there is CKD with albuminuria and a good EGFR, you would go for the SGLT2 inhibitor first. And now I want to bring to your attention the latest guidelines that have come out from ADA, just hot off the press in 2022, where there is a big change again in the pharmacological approach to glycemic target in the standards of medical care in diabetes where the first-line therapy is not touted to be metformin anymore, but it depends on the comorbidities, patient-centered treatment factors, including care and access considerations and management needs, and generally includes metformin and comprehensive lifestyle management. And having gone through the guidelines with you, I want to go over why the other answers do not provide the same cardiovascular benefit and our focus should be on comorbidities treatment. Saxagliptin was one choice, which is a DPP-4 inhibitor, and despite sharing similar mechanisms as GLP-1 receptor agonists, the DPP-4 inhibitor agents, while safe from a CVD standpoint, they were not found to reduce cardiovascular risks. This particular agent was studied in the SAVER trial. And the other choice we had was glipicide, which is a sulfonylurea. And some studies have said that they, they may have adverse cardiovascular events, but I want to make a point that glimepiride may be the safest option because in the Carolina trial, when glimepiride was compared versus linagliptin, the cardiovascular benefits were equivalent in both of these drugs, and there was no major adverse event with glimepiride as far as cardiovascular endpoints are concerned. And the last option we had in that question was ertogliflozin, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor. And while this class of medication generally has cardiovascular disease benefit, this particular agent did not show that in the Virtus cardiovascular trial. So, you decide to start semaglutide. Which of the following situations would prevent you from prescribing a GLP-1 receptor agonist? One, personal history of diabetic retinopathy. Two, family history of MEN2. Three, current use of SDLT2 inhibitors. Four, current use of insulin. And the right answer is two family history of MEN2. So the only absolute contraindication to GLP-1 receptor agonist is a personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer, which is a part of MEN2 along with pheochromocytoma and parathyroid hyperplasia or marfanide habitus and mucosal neuromas. Semaglutide caused T cell or medullary thyroid tumors in rats and mice, but not in monkeys or humans as far as we can tell. If someone develops local symptoms of thyroid enlargement, new thyroid lump with pain or difficulty swallowing, hoarse voice, difficulty breathing, while on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, it is reasonable to hold this medication and assess for MTC or medullary thyroid cancer. And some GLP-1 receptor agonists like semaglutide subcutaneous 
appears to be associated with increased incidence of diabetic retinopathy complications such as vitreous hemorrhage, onset of blindness, and need for diabetic retinopathy treatment. So for patients with pre-existing diabetic retinopathy, it would be reasonable to consider lower dose therapy and to monitor for complications with retinal exams annually. And I do want to mention that the sole study is underway where they did baseline diabetic retinopathy evaluations for patients. And we will know if the diabetic retinopathy was indeed due to the medication itself or it was a pre-existing condition. And it was the rapid reduction in A1C that precipitated the diabetic retinopathy or was it the medication itself? And I want to mention that they did not have baseline uh, eye exams done in all those previous studies. And that's why it's important to wait for the results and outcomes of the sole study. And now let's come to the other complication of GLP-1 RA use. There have been some reports of pancreatitis. And these, I want to mention, have been only in some small case series reports, not in major trials. And this is not a contraindication at this time. But please keep in mind that it should be considered in a patient who has otherwise unexplained pancreatitis or in patients who are otherwise predisposed to pancreatitis, like excess alcohol consumption, high triglycerides, and gallstones. And GLP-1 receptor uh, agonists and with other type 2 medications. So the GLP-1 receptor agonists, they lower the A1C by 0.8 to 2%. It does not cause hypoglycemia by itself, but can in combination with other medications like sulfonylurea and or insulin. If blood sugars are already at goal, please consider lowering the insulin by 20% when starting a GLP-1 RA and those adjust or stop the secretagogues like sulfonylureas and megalitonides. And bear in mind that the SDLT2 inhibitors and metformin can be con continued at the same dose. And the other important factor I do want to mention is, please stop the DPP-4 inhibitors when starting the GLP-1 receptor agonist medications. As you know, they both work by similar mechanisms and both together have an additive risk of acute pancreatitis but there is no additive benefit of being on both. And obviously the GLP-1 RA is preferred because of all the benefits of cardiovascular benefits it uh, uh, gives. And level of the synthetic GLP-1 receptor, GLP-1 is 100 times higher versus the level of endogenous native GLP-1 from a DPP-4 inhibition. So now let's come to the practical aspects of how do you prescribe the GLP-1 receptor agonist? So here I've listed some of the most common agents that are used, and along with the year in which the FDA approval was obtained for each of these medications, the dosing frequency, and the recommended dosage. So the motto to keep in mind while starting a GLP-1 receptor agonist is start low, go slow. So you always start at the lowest dose and titrate up as slowly as possible as required so that the adverse effects are minimized. So the common ones are liraglutide, which is marketed as Victoza once daily at 0.6 milligrams subcutaneous once daily, and then you can go up to 1.2 to 1.8. And the, other medica the same medication is also marketed as Sexenda for weight loss at 3 milligrams per day. And dulaglutide is marketed as Trulicity at 0.75 milligrams subcutaneous once weekly. And you can increase to 1.5 milligrams and actually can go up to 3 and to 4.5 milligrams max dose subcutaneous once weekly. Semaglutide subcutaneous is marketed as Ozempic. It's once a week and it's at 0.25 milligrams once a week. You keep at this dose for four weeks and then you can go up to 0.5 milligrams once a week. And hot off the press, if needed, it can be increased to two milligrams subcutaneous once a week for diabetes management. And the oral semaglutide is marketed as ribelsis 
and it got the FDA approval in 2019. It's a once daily drug with three milligrams PO once daily for 30 days, then increased to seven milligrams once daily. And if needed, it can be increased to 14 milligrams once daily max. And all of these come with the pen, the auto injector comes with a very fine 32 gauge four millimeter injection needles that are disposable. And they are really, uh, they can be injected on the abdomen, uh, thigh or the upper arm. And once you start the dose, there is no need, there is no restriction on how long a patient can be on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And it can be continued for as long as you think there is benefit from it. And cost is a limiting factor for these, but that depends on the insurance and the coverage that the patient gets from their own insurances. And um, GLP-1 receptor agonists are really preferred when there are metabolic risk factors like uncontrolled diabetes, apart from all the other comorbidity benefits that they do um, confer. So in follow-up, for this co coming back to our patient, who's a 65-year-old male with diabetes, the patient started on subcutaneous semaglutide, Ozempic, at 0.25 milligrams per week. And after four weeks, he increased it to 0.5 milligrams per week as instructed. Two weeks after the dose increase, he developed nausea. And a day later, he presented to the ED with emesis and lightheadedness. Vitals, blood pressure 104 over 68 millimeters of mercury, heart rate 116 beats per minute, and weight 173 pounds. The serum creatinine was elevated at 1.8, the baseline was 1.1, and his CMP and lipase were normal. He received IV fluid resuscitation and was discharged home. The nausea and dizziness have resolved, and he's back to his normal PO intake. He's due to take his next Ozempic dose. What would you recommend? What do you do now? Which of the following would you recommend for this patient? One, resume 0.25 milligram semaglutide subcutaneous dose and titrate up more slowly. Two, consume smaller portion sizes and reduce fat intake. Three, keep a log of foods that cause the nausea. Four, all of the above. The right answer is four, all of the above. Remember, we do resume it at the lower dose and titrate it up more slowly, like I mentioned earlier. Start low and go slow, but because of the mechanism of action, as it reduces the gastric motility, asking the patient to consume smaller portion serving sizes and reducing the fat intake will immensely help in reducing the adverse effects. And keeping a log of foods that cause the nausea is definitely going to help the patient in avoiding those uh, food items. So we went over the adverse effects earlier. And you know, GLP-1 RAs, they induce satiety and they slow the gastric emptying, leading to a sense of fullness and reduced appetite. And there is transient nausea and abdominal discomfort, which is very common. And I'll talk about this with evidence from the trials later on. And we have to counsel the patients that behavioral changes such as smaller portion serving sizes and lower fat intake will help reduce the symptoms. And definitely, we should counsel them to stop eating when they start feeling full. And keeping a log of foods that can cause nausea is noted to be extremely helpful. And for patients with more significant symptoms, return to the last tolerated GLP-1 RA dose and then titrate up more slowly. And sometimes switching to an alternative GLP-1 RA can also result in better tolerability. And please be aware of persistent abdominal pain as GLP-1 RA may be associated with pancreatitis. And if pancreatitis occurs while on the GLP-1 RA, discontinue the GLP-1 RA medication. And I've been talking about the comorbidities and the cardiovascular benefits of this class of drugs. I just wanted to share with you a brief summary outline of all the individual trials and the meta-analysis of these class of drugs that have shown the cardiovascular benefits. And on the, you'll find on the left-hand side the MACE, or the Major Adverse Cardiovascular Events in Individual Trials. And as you can see, only the elixir with the lixisenatide did not show 
that great a benefit, whereas, as you can see, the hazard ratios, anywhere between 10 to 20 percent reduction of the major adverse cardiovascular events are shown in all the trials from leader to sustain to rewind and pioneer six. And on the right hand side, you can see the meta analysis with the individual cardiovascular endpoints. Yet again, it shows us that there is a great, great risk reduction in all the cardiovascular risks with these medications in all these trials across the board. And we talked about the heart failure benefits and the CVD benefits. And now I'm just sharing a summary slide with you all with the GLP-1 receptor agonists with their renal benefits. Again, in all these trials, as you can see from the hazard ratios on the right-hand side in the results of all the trials there, it shows a great risk reduction in all of them. And the FLOW trial is the ongoing one that will be completed in 2024. And that is also looking at cardiovascular and renal risk reductions in GLP-1 receptor agonists. Now, after having talked about the benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonists for all the cardiovascular risk reductions and the CKD risk reductions, let's move on to case two, uh, where we learn about identifying indications and contraindications for SGLT2 inhibitor therapy, summarize the literature on CVD and CKD production with SGLT protection with SGLT2 inhibitors, review how to prescribe common SGLT2 inhibitor agents, recognize and manage adverse effects from SGLT2 inhibitor medications. So let's start with our case. A 59-year-old man presents for type 2 diabetes. Diabetes was diagnosed 12 years ago. His most recent A1C was 8.5% on metformin, 1,000 milligrams twice daily. He has chronic kidney disease with an EGFR of 49 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared and moderately increased albuminuria of 200 milligrams per day. He also has a history of hypertension and is on lisinopril 20 milligrams daily and amlodipine 10 milligrams daily and hyperlipidemia on atorvastatin 80 milligrams daily. He does not use tobacco and he has no complaints in the office. Vital signs, blood pressure 134 over 78 millimeters of mercury, heart rate 66 beats per minute, weight is 162 pounds with a corresponding BMI of 28 kilograms per meter squared. So addition of which of the following agents is the best next step to manage this patient? One, citagliptin, two, lantus insulin, three, glimepiride, four, dapagliflozin. And the correct answer is four, dapagliflozin. So why did we choose dapagliflozin? As I said earlier, the 2022 ADA guidelines for treatment of adults with type 2 diabetes states that first-line therapy depends on comorbidities, patient-centered treatment factors, including costs and access considerations and management needs, and generally includes metformin and comprehensive lifestyle medications, lifestyle changes. Our choice of anti-diabetes medications should be heavily driven by a patient's comorbidities. In our patient, he has a history of CKD with a reduced GFR and increased albuminuria. In patients with kidney disease and albuminuria, SGLT2 inhibitors is the treatment of choice, preferably one with primary evidence of reducing CKD progression. The SGLT2 inhibitor, which has FDA approval for CKD, are dapagliflozin and canagliflozin. For canagliflozin and dapagliflozin, the Credence trial and the DAPA CKD trial had renal-specific primary endpoints with DAPA CKD showing benefit regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes. Empagliflozin has evidence of reducing CKD in CVOTs or cardiovascular outcome trials. And for empagliflozin, the EMPAREG outcome trial showed improved renal outcomes in those with type 2 diabetes at high risk for CVD. And the EMPA kidney is an ongoing clinical trial with primary aim to investigate the effect of empagliflozin on kidney disease progression or cardiovascular death in those with pre-existing CKD. 
So I hope I've convinced you as to why we chose dapagliflozin and why that is the right choice for this patient. And SDLT2 inhibitors should be given to all patients with stage 3 CKD or higher and type 2 diabetes, regardless of glycemic control, as they slow CKD progression and reduce heart failure risk independent of glycemic control. It is also very important that the ADA 2022 guidelines have said that SDLT2 inhibitors should be given to all patients with uh, stage 3 CKD or higher, as I mentioned earlier. And these are the medications that we should be thinking about adding to a patient's regimen, regardless of their A1C. And worsening albuminuria and reduced EGFR, both independently and together, um, are associated with higher risk of major cardiovascular events, kidney failure, and all-cause mortality. A 30% reduction in albuminuria is associated with a 1% absolute risk reduction of kidney failure in 10 years. SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists reduce the risk of progression to macroalbuminuria by 20 to 30%. And for those with macroalbuminuria, they reduce albuminuria by 30 to 40%. And SGLT2 inhibitors reduce hospitalization due to heart failure more than GLP-1 receptor agonists, and both reduce the risk of cardiovascular events, whereas the GLP-1 receptor agonists are superior to SGLT2 inhibitors in reducing metabolic risks. So I mentioned again why we chose dapagliflozin, and I think, I hope I've convinced you as to the reason why dapagliflozin, the SGLT2 inhibitor, is the right choice in this patient. So you decide to start dapagliflozin, which of the following situations would prevent you from prescribing that dapagliflozin? One, history of heart failure, two, history of UTI, three, EGFR 22 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, four, current use of insulin. So the right answer is three, EGFR 22, uh, because FDA has not yet approved use of dapagliflozin below 25 ml per minute per 1.73 meters squared. So now I just want to briefly go over the SGLT2 inhibitor dosing with, uh, with you. So SGLT2 inhibitor initiation for type 2 diabetes. Dapagliflozin comes in 5 and 10 milligrams. The EGFR should be greater than 45. Empagliflozin comes in 10 and 25, and the EGFR should be greater than 30. Canagliflozin comes in 100 and 300 milligrams. The EGFR should be greater than 30. Ertugliflozin comes in 5 and 15 milligrams, and the EGFR should be greater than 45. Often, if already established on an SGLT2 inhibitor, it may be continued at a lower EGFR for the renal and cardiovascular benefits. I wanted you to keep that in mind. It is still contraindicated in a patient on dialysis and end-stage kidney disease. So following up on our patient, two weeks after starting dapagliflozin, the patient calls the office complaining of lightheadedness throughout the day. This seems to be worse when standing up from a seated position, and they deny fever, chills, urinary symptoms, nausea, or vomiting. Which of the following would be your next step? One, have patient check their blood pressure and stay well hydrated. Two, check renal function panel. Three, obtain urine analysis. Four, have the patient start self-monitored blood glucose given your concern for hypoglycemia. So the right answer is one, have the patient check their blood pressure and stay well hydrated. We'll look into that a little bit more. So I want to go over the SDLT2 inhibitor side effects. So hypoglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis, urinary tract infections, genital mycotic infections, bone fracture, limb amputation, necrotizing fasciitis, and volume depletion. All of these have been reported. And what our patient had, it looks like, is volume depletion based on the symptomatology. And I want to briefly go over some of these side effects with you all, and I'll talk to you about which one of them have actually been reported in 
majority of the trials and which ones have just been reported in a single large trial a little bit later on in this presentation today. So just like the GLP-1 receptor agonists, I want you to bear in mind that the SGLT2 inhibitors do not cause hypoglycemia by themselves. However, when used concurrently with other medications that do, such as insulin or sulfonylurea, you may see hypoglycemia. So be cognizant of the patient's glucose control prior to starting this class of medication, and we often decrease the dose of the sulfonylurea or insulin by about 20% when starting. And the euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a very frightening side effect, does occur when the patient is able to excrete excess glucose through the urine, leading to normal glucose values of less than 250, but with all the signs, symptoms, and need for insulin therapy that accompany DKA. And although more common in patients on insulin, it can also happen in patients on o only oral anti-diabetic medications. Intravascular volume depletion. This is due to the osmotic diuresis, and that may lead to the lightheadedness, hypotension, or even acute kidney injury. Be mindful of the patient's blood pressure control and monitor the blood pressure and kidney function after initiation, and they may require dose reductions of antihypertensive medications. So as I mentioned to you, I went over the side effects of the SDLT2 inhibitors, the hypoglycemia, the diabetic ketoacidosis, and the volume depletion, and how to deal, deal with them. And now I just want to go over this table, which I think very nicely summarizes the strategies to mitigate the adverse effects of both SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And as you can see, the most common ones, the frequently reported ones in common in multiple large clinical trials for the SDLT2 inhibitors are only two, the genital fungal infections and volume depletion. And the DKA was actually reported only in, increased risk was reported in meta-analysis of clinical trials. And the UTI was reported in a single large clinical trial. And as for the GLP-1 receptor agonists, the one that was reported across the board with an increased risk in large clinical trials is the low severity but high frequency one is the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And the cholelithiasis and cholecystitis was reported only in a single large clinical trial. And acute pancreatitis, though the severity is high, was only reported in small clinical trials or case series. And I just want to emphasize that for the volume depletion with the SDLT2 inhibitors, please be proactive, let the patients know about it, and when they have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, ask them to hold these medications and implement the sick day protocol. And for the DKA, education of the patient, early recognition, and asking them to stop these medications, testing for ketones and fluid resuscitation and fluid intake maintenance is of paramount importance. And if a patient develops abdominal pain uh, with the, uh, and you think they have acute pancreatitis, we should ask them to hold it, and we should use it with caution in those with history of pancreatitis. And I just want to um, talk about the mechanism of action of the SDLT2 inhibitors. So the first column, you have the afferent and efferent arterioles at the same size. And in diabetes, as you can see, there is dilated afferent arteriole and constricted efferent arteriole. And using ACEs and ACE and ARBs actually causes vasodilation of the efferent arteriole. And the SDLT2 inhibitors cause the vasoconstriction of the dilated afferent arteriole in diabetes. And therefore, they both act together and really help protect the kidney. And the mechanism of action of the SDLT2 inhibitors for kidney protection is thought to be this. The increased sodium and chloride that is sensed in the macula densa results in the tubuloglomerular feedback, which causes renal afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction. And this vasoconstriction will decrease the gl glomerular filtration and glomerular hypertension, thus leading to kidney protection. And I'll just end with showing a snapshot of all the CVOT trials that have been ongoing since 2008. And 
over 190,000 patients have been enrolled in the CVOT trials. And you can read the names of these trials here. And I've already shown you the demonstrated benefit with CVOT, heart failure, and the CKD with these trials, with the DPP, not with the DPP-4 inhibitors, but with the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SDLT-2 inhibitors. And this is just a nice flowchart of recommendations for SDLT2 inhibitors versus GLP-1 receptor agonists on the basis of kidney failure risk stratification. And I thought it was a very nice summary slide that would help guide you in your clinical practice. Please go through this at your leisure. And I know that I did not talk about heart failure in my two case studies. They were all focused on the uh, ASCVD and the CKD. But I do want to mention that the SDLT2 inhibitors have shown great benefit in heart failure. As you can see in the DAPA-HF study, the hazard ratios have shown 25% reduction, risk reduction due to for worsening heart failure or CV death. And the Emperor Reduced study is showing similar results with the primary outcome being the composite of CV death or hospitalization for heart failure with empagliflozin. And the Emperor Preserved study uh, showed that it reduced the combined risk of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure in patients with heart failure and a preserved ejection fraction regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes. So this is again just an algorithm to guide you in your clinical practice of which, when would you use the CK, in CKD, the SDLT2 inhibitor versus a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And this is just a summary slide of all the uh, landmark CVOT uh, studies in type 2 diabetes with SDLT2 inhibitors. And th this also highlights the uh, studies with the kidney outcomes. And with this, I will leave you and um, thank you.